John Golia. I'm Greg Fife. And I'm Todd Curtis. And we are the Flight Safety Detectives. Between us, we have over a century of aviation accident investigation and safety experience to draw on as we discuss issues that affect all of us. So we are qualified to share our perspectives on accidents and incidents and what can be learned from them for the future. We're proud to say that we have two sponsors that really relate to the topic of aviation safety. The Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, or PAMA, and Avemco Insurance. Later on in the show, we'll tell you how you can get a 5% discount on your insurance just for listening to the show. We don't just dissect the official reports. In every episode, we identify safety issues and take the mystery out of accident investigations. So maybe pilots in their planes can have safer flights ahead. Well, good morning, guys. Morning. Hey, John. Again, I'm glad to see both of you. You know, we don't have Greg again on this session. He's tied up. So it's up to the three of us. And Miles, we're going to put you on the spot and have you take the lead and in, in and uh, run this little adventure. All right, gentlemen. Uh, John Golia, Todd Curtis, uh, guys who know a lot about deconstructing these things. Uh, we're going to do some probing questions uh, with you. But first, let's run through what we know based on the NTSB preliminary report. This is February 7th, 2024. Not that long ago. Uh, we're talking about an aircraft, uh, a uh, Beach Hawker 900 XP, high performance uh, biz jet, took off from Grand Junction, Colorado, was on its way to Gig Harbor, uh, Washington. So uh, it had a, a long mission in mind. However, what makes this uh, uh, accident uh, come, well, what made it happen is that this flight occurred after some maintenance on the leading edge of the wing, specifically the, the TKS system. I've flown with the TKS. Essentially, that's a it's a glycol mixture which uh, comes across the wing, and it's uh, an anti-icing uh, component on an aircraft. And uh, they took at the aircraft, at the uh, maintenance facility in Grand Junction, they took the leading edge off to take a look at that uh, TKS system, inspect it for cracks, and uh, put it back on. And according to the uh, aircraft manufacturer um, guidelines, uh, when you do that, uh, you need to do a, a stall check on the aircraft. So the, the flight crew of two, we don't know anything about the pilots yet. Uh, flight crew of two working for a, a notable aviation uh, company, Clay Lacey Aviation, absolutely legendary in in the world of aviation. We'll talk to John a little bit about that. Uh, took off on their way to Gig Harbor, but decided uh, shortly after departure to do that required stall test. And uh, so they were uh, at 20,000 feet um, mean sea level, which put them um, at uh, above ground. Uh, I believe it was, uh, do the math for me real quickly, Todd, above ground, they were uh, less than 10,000 above ground. Is that correct? Yes. Which is very interesting because this stall test, which we're going to talk about at length here, and it's very specific and squirrely in this aircraft, this stall test, according to the manufacturer, should occur uh, no higher than 18,000 feet and no low lower than 10,000 feet above the ground. 18,000 mean sea level, 10,000 above the ground. And in this case, they were at 20,000 MSL. So they were above, which still put them below the distance to the ground. So they were in the, a bad place to do this. So um, they asked for a, um, some block altitude from the controller in order to uh, do this test. And um, they got that from flight level 180 to flight level 200. But as they conducted this stall test, uh, 
Uh, things apparently went uh, very wrong very quickly. Uh, and uh, it, it appears to all accounts here, what you have is you know, a spin scenario, perhaps in instrument conditions, perhaps with uh, control surfaces sort of locked up uh, which they were unable to recover from in the amount of altitude they had to play with. And they both uh, perished in this crash. And when you look at the pictures of the wreckage, it obviously uh, landed um, in in uh, at high speed. So let's go through this. First of all, the uh, gentleman, for, let, let's talk, John, um, and establish here, Clay Lacey Aviation. We talk a lot about in aviation, you know, who do you trust when you charter an airplane? This is blue chip, right? This is a company that has a tremendous reputation, correct? Oh, one of the best. In fact, in my in my past, I've done uh, work for people vetting their charter companies, where rich people or people that are going to be chartering airplanes on a regular basis are looking for reliable and uh, safety conscious operators. And I have recommended Clay Lisa multiple times based on personal experience. I've visited with them out there. I've seen their operation. Uh, you know, I, I've flown with uh, Bob Hoover, who was in, uh, associated with these folks. He was there all the time. And other people that I know, uh, famous flyers in their own right, that were associated with this. This is a first-class operation. And okay. his pilots usually reflected that first-class operation. So, uh, I don't know what happened with these particular crew, if they were vetted. Uh, it appears like they've been around a while. Uh, so it, it uh, that's one of the first things the FAA is going to be looking at, is what what this flight crew was up to. What were, the, you know, were they tired? Um, you know, did they understand these rules? Because we see where they, they uh, called for a block of, of uh, airspace so they could do the test but it, they didn't meet the qualification. You mentioned the altitude, but it also is supposed to be in IF in VFR conditions, up in 10,000 10, feet above the clouds, which they certainly weren't. So uh, there's a number of issues around the, the flight crew that need to be explored by the F, by the NTSB. Well, they started off <clears throat> in a hole on this. They're at 20,000 feet, which is above the requirement and too low to the ground and in IMC. Right there, Todd, what you have is, um, we don't know the experience level of the pilots, but uh, Chuck Yeager would be in a tough position in this case, right? In a tough position for a couple of reasons. One of the things that strikes me, and I had full disclosure, I had a very small part of my career as a military flight test engineer out at Edwards. And the thing that struck me about this is that they were doing this very shortly after takeoff. They took off at 10.37 uh, uh, local time, and the crash happened about 11 minutes later. And this was a flight that they were taking from Colorado over to the Puget Sound area. So they had some time between takeoff and, and landing to do this. My question is, why do it so quickly? Yeah, well, because <clears throat> what, if it, what if they had a, a problem? I, I can understand why they did it so quickly, because if there's something that isn't up, operating properly they want to take it right back to the maintenance base they're not going to take it on All right, well that's so a that good means... point you know the mate the guy who did the work is back there in grand junction so you take off make sure you're you're and, and you have to meet a requirement this is a manufacturer requirement when you take off that that stainless steel leading edge for the tks system you have to do a stall test that's what the manufacturer says so i guess you know this put it, these decisions just confine this by you know dovetailing off of uh, a, an existing flight, puts them over a uh, little you know higher ground than where they began, puts them in IMC, puts them you know behind the power curve so to speak, and when you look at the, the you know the the POH the uh, pilots operating handbook uh, for the Hawker 900 XP stalls are some serious business in this aircraft. Now first of all. For those of us who have stalled a 172 or any sort of uh, single engine piston, this is a whole different ballgame when you're talking about a you know a, a biz jet with swept wings, right? Yep, the swept wings make it really challenging. And another thing about the uh, operating handbook, it said something to the effect of, you know, banks should be under 20 degrees. And 
for those of you watching the video version of this, we're playing a clip that was from another hawker doing a stall test. And this one was, uh, as you can see, considerably more than 20 degrees. And quite frankly, it looked kind of frightening looking out the window. Now, in this video, you see there are mountains out in front of them. At the crash site, at the time of the crash, the weather report at the location of the crash and at the departure report before and after they departed indicated that you had light rain and, and a ceiling of 10,000 feet or less. I don't know if this was solid cloud cover and they had no ability to see the ground or if it was cloudy uh, to the point that they had an indistinct horizon. But certainly if you have something other than clear skies, you don't have the luxury of using the ground as a reference point as you're spiraling. Uh, presumably in control before they went out of control. So the, the the conditions for a stall in this aircraft, there are seven of them. <clears throat> Altitude must be above 10,000 above ground and uh, below 18,000 MSL, may, mean sea level. They must be conducted in VMC. So we're over two there. Autopilot must be disengaged. We presume that was the case. The stall identification system must be operative. I, who knows on that? What the, the CVR will certainly tell us this. All the external services must be free from ice. That Who knows? That might be a factor. <clears throat> the ventral fuel tank must be empty. Again, uh, that's work we're going to have to understand. The weather radar must be at standby. And um, the yaw damper switch off, on and on it goes. And then the technique. <clears throat> Did you read this technique? It's really very specific. Dolls with flaps retracted in the takeoff configuration should be carried out at idle thrust to reduce altitude loss and approach or landing flaps. Thrust should be adjusted not to exceed 77% of N1. Once thrust is set, it should, be, should not be reduced during the approach and stall recovery. The airplane should be trimmed at an airspeed of approximately 1.4 VS1 in the appropriate configuration. <clears throat> the airspeed should be reduced not more than one knot per second rapid or violent movements of any control during the approach or the stall should be avoided, particularly at, uh, at air speeds below the operation of the stick shaker. Yaw damper off. The stall is uh, uh, enunciations eliminated, et cetera, et cetera. Then there's the cautions. Did you read these? Um, there's this thing called aileron snatch. Gentlemen, aileron snatch can occur prior to a stall and is not acceptable. Doesn't sound good. I think I know what it is, but I want you guys to elaborate. In the sessions that I fly, um, that sort of uh, radical uh, response of the ailerons is not something that I've experienced when I did stalls or, or spin training back in the day. How does it work with a complex aircraft like this? Well, those without powered flight controls are very suspect of this, this snapping the ailerons to a fully deflected position. And We've had, while I was at the board, we've had a uh, few accidents that had this type of event occur. And it, every airplane is a little bit different on how to recover from them, but you have to unload it. You have to change something in order to unload it to get your flight controls back. And it, what it reminds me of sometimes is uh, that 727 over Detroit that the flight crew ended up putting the airplane reverses in reverse in order to get their flight controls back to work. And that airplane was gonna crash if they didn't do something different because they had no control. They had no control over the airplane. So uh, this aileron snatch is, is a surprise for the crew. And it, because it's not a powered flight control system, it takes a heck of a lot of force to try to overcome it. That's why you want to unload the flight controls or unload the airflow over the, the flight control so that you can have some control back. Now, when Miles was going over the uh, con the considerations and con conditions for this test, uh, about the only one that I could actually see some data on was, was the speed reduced by one knot per second or less? The NTSB has a graphic that is based on the, on the uh, flight data recorder that shows at least for the segment before it had a rapid descent, it was reducing airspeed at about one per second. That said, there is a flight data recorder and a cockpit voice recorder. I don't know how many parameters are going to be in that flight data recorder and whether or not there will be enough parameters to see if all of the various stalling technique conditions were met when they did this. 
Well, isn't it good that these aircraft are now so equipped? That that's you know relatively new. I think aircraft after early '90s are, are in ten seats, I believe, or something like that. Uh, now require that, and that's good. We have this because this will be very uh, interesting for future and to inform safety. The final caution is worth noting here: pilots conducting stall checks should have prior experience in performing stalls in the Hawker and must be prepared for unacceptable behavior at any point leading up to and throughout the maneuver. I, I've got to tell you, gentlemen, if it, if this was something I had not done, I would never do this. I don't know about you. I, I'd be I'd be scared to death to try it. Even if the, these pilots had experience doing it, my question would be, is there some currency requirement? Did they have to do this within the last six months? Did they have to do it on a simulator before they did it in an aircraft. What were the regulations? What was the policy of the company prior to them getting the airplane and taking off? And did they meet or exceed those minimum uh, uh, levels? And if there was a minimum level, was it high enough? Was it an industry standard? Is this something the flight test pilots at uh, the manufacturer would have done? Going back a little bit to the uh, age of this aircraft, this was produced in 2007. So as you said before, it would have been required to have a flight data recorder. It's unclear to me how sophisticated that recorder would have been, or would it have been normally upgraded as time went on in the 17 years since it was manufactured to a more modern flight data recorder? Well, if it was digital, the upgrades are pretty easy, but I'm not uh, familiar enough with it to say that it was a digital not just the record of itself being digital, but the systems that it's reading, if they were digital, then it's a simple tap off the digital, off the data bus to, to get parameters. But uh, we'll find out that when the NTSB releases it. But there's another, another interesting point in the cautions that it's not highlighted, but that you actually can enter a stall with no pre-warning. You know? yeah. So you have a stick shaker that's right. supposed to come on uh, prior to the the event, uh, but there's no cues in the seat of your pants, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the airplane doesn't shake. I remember when I was learning how to fly and, and doing stalls back when they used to require it, and I did them every single time we went out, the, the flight instructors that I used every single time. The last thing we did was, was uh, an approach to the stall, and I can remember learning to feel it coming because of the airplane and the, and the just the subtle vibrations as you start to approach the stall and that you would learn it. And then this, apparently in this airplane, they don't have that cue. So if there was something not operating properly with the stick shaker, which they may have been opt, may have disabled uh, because of maintenance, you know, if they had this apart and they were doing other checks with power on the airplane, uh, they may have turned that off for convenience. Mm. And who knows if that, how they turned it off, just pulling the breaker on or what else. And, and there's uh, another thing I'd like to circle back to what uh, Miles was saying earlier. This maneuver was started 2,000 feet above the maximum recommended altitude. And from an aerodynamic perspective, how radically will things change with respect to the aircraft response going from 18,000 to 20,000 feet? You know, these guys had a number of, of points working against them, and all of those points were in their control. So, you know, one calls into question their decision making, their preparations for doing this test. Uh, where maybe they was they had done it so many times they were complacent. See, that's I'm wondering if that's it. John, you know, is this a case where you've got, you know, high time experienced pilots who've got, you know, we've talked about this before, this idea that you try something stupid and you get away with it and you and you think you're 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 smarter and better, but you're playing Russian roulette. Could it have been one of those scenarios? All right. So, gentlemen, in the category of, you know, the rules are written in blood, incidents make us safer. We have to ask the question here. I think it's kind of a first principles question. Why is this test required, right? You've taken off that stainless steel strip at the leading edge of the aircraft to check the, the glycol system that takes ice off the wings. Presumably the test is to make sure the stick shaker or any audible indications of a stall still works, right? Okay, so does that mean you need to fully stall the aircraft? I don't think so, right? I mean, I'm, I'm curious. Um, 
whether that might be a good outcome here is to modify this manufacturer's requirement to say, you know, test it to the point of a stick shaker. Or if you're going to do a full stall, you know, you got to call up a, a test pilot to do this. What do you guys think? Well, I agree with that 100%. You know, why, why stall the airplane? Stick shaker comes on at 7%. You know, you know, I would I would say not to do a full stall. The yeah, risk declare, is just you too declare high. victory. Declare victory and fly on to Gig Harbor with it having proven the stick shaker works, right? Right. And I, this I is a, calls into question: What's the usual standard for a, this class of aircraft when it comes to this kind of flight test? Is this something where there have been accidents before that were possibly avoidable because, you know, this sort of test was a uh, had the potential to have a radical outcome and the above average pilot may not be able to get out of that radical outcome. And for all we know, we have two seasoned Hawker drivers who spent a lot of time in type and uh, have done this before, et cetera. Uh, but that, you know, you, you learn this time again in aviation. Uh, oftentimes that, that sense of overconfidence is what kills you. And the advantage that we have with this accident is that it happened in a country that's going to put, one would hope, significant resources into the analysis of it. I could easily see this happening in any number of places around the world where people can afford to fly in that sort of jet fly. And in many of those countries, you're not going to have anything even as good as the preliminary report that we have here. That's not a knock on these countries. That's just a reality of the situation. Right. It's a, it's a question of resources. Yep. So we've, we've identified four or five areas that we expect more information from the NTSB on, uh, and we will upgrade and update this as time goes on. Yeah, I think we should. This is an, this is an interesting one because it does get into uh, issues of experience or lack thereof, and and ultimately, kind of the unintended consequences. You know, with all good intentions, the manufacturers like, oh, of course you should test the stall it after you've taken this piece off, but if you really think it through. Maybe that isn't the wisest, safest course of action. You know, and I wonder if they thought it through themselves. You know, I always hop on pre-planning before your flight. I wonder if these guys pre-planned what they were doing or just said, well, we got to do a stall check, you know, as well, soon as we take off. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, contributing factor that, um, you know, when when Todd was mentioning what why were they going to Gig Harbor, if they had gone in the other direction where they wouldn't have, you know, they would have had a little more uh, distance between them and the ground, might have been a different outcome. So may, maybe it should have been a separate maintenance flight right. before they shouldn't have been underway to Gig Harbor yet. All these things go into that decision making and flight planning like you like to harp on. But that, those are such important decisions that are made on the ground. Right. And most maintenance test flights. Are exactly what you just said. Take off, perform the test, back to sender, back right. to where yeah. you came from. And we have had other accidents. I'm thinking of, of uh, Airborne Express DC-8 coming out of a, a repair station in Tennessee, heading back to Ohio. Uh, uh, I've forgotten where they were in Ohio, Dayton, Dayton, Ohio, heading back there to put the airplane back in service for hauling boxes. And they had the crew on board and a couple of mechanics or one or two mechanics on board. And they were doing all those maintenance checks en route back to Ohio and crashed. And so it's not the first time that, that we've tried to get a twofer. The right. maintenance test flight and the repositioning flight out of the same flight. And, uh, you know, sometimes it more, doesn't work. Aviators love to multitask, but this is not a good good approach, is it? No, not at all. Not at all. Because you got to think through what you're doing. Right? It's not, it's not just an add-on to your flying. You're thinking through before you even start of what you have to do in its entirety and what do you do if it doesn't work right. And it's not an add-on to an existing flight, but yet we have operators that try to do that to to, uh, you know, they're on a schedule. They've got to pick up, in this case, he's got to go pick up some people in, at Gig Harbor. You know, they need to get it out. Maybe the airplane was delayed coming out of uh, maintenance. 
So put even more time pressure on. Those are all the things that we would expect the NTSB to put in the next report. Yeah, that's an interesting component there. You're right. They were presumably going to pick up a client, right? And so they might have been pressed for time. How many times does that come into play in an accident? Oh, way, way too many. <laughs> way too many. You know, and that, that's a, a way we see it. I mean, a, a way, it's the operating way of, of everybody in aviation that's trying to make money. I mean, I I work for airlines, and I've been subject to that kind of pressure over and over and over. And sometimes you just say, "Hey, you know, we're not doing it." And you know, they get your manager might get mad at you, but you know, what are they going to do? Now, in my uh, case, and this, uh, I think, constitutes the uh, next to last word. I don't fly those kinds of aircraft. I fly. Smaller uh, training aircraft systems primarily, but one of the thing that is that uh, one of the things that is uh, the same no matter what level of aviation you're in is this is a non routine flight. This is something that they're not doing every mission or even every month. If you're doing something non routine, what John says pre flight preparing thinking it through is even more important than usual. Hey, I have a whole. I'll give my last word now. Miles can have the last word. But I have a whole pitch that I do when I talk to pilots and maintenance people about when the airplane is coming out of maintenance. You don't do the same free flight you do when you're just going out and picking up your airplane. I mean, you open those panels and I, I challenge and one of the companies that I work for, I would go with them purposely when they picked up an airplane and I would watch them do the free flight coming out and then I would stop them and say okay let's go back did you review what was done to your airplane not the logbook this package of material that sometimes can be a half an inch thick did you look at it to see what what they did to your airplane did they touch the flight controls damn it if they did that that means you should be going through flight controls very thoroughly you know what did they do be prepared did they did they have a landing gear problem well in your in your pre-planning, what do we do if the gear doesn't come up or down? Now you need to be ready for it. So there's lots of pieces that get added on to your thinking process before you go flying when you pick up an airplane for maintenance. And do they do it? No. You know, just opening panels and look inside. And I had a young lady, and it, it could have been a guy too, but this particular time it was a, a young lady. And she said, well, I don't even know what I'm looking at in there. I said, well, when you do it enough, you're going to identify things. But if you look in and look for rags, look for wrenches left behind, I mean, that's stuff that you should be looking at. Just look around. After a little while, you'll get to know what's normal and what might not be normal. So, you know, what? what's that saying? It takes common sense, but it's not common. Something mm -hmm. like that. Well, you know, you you hit on a very important point here, John. We've been focused on the flight crew here. This was the first flight after maintenance. And any pilot will tell you that is a, a flight you take with great trepidation and care and caution because things happen. Things get rigged wrong and backwards. And who knows? There could be a maintenance component to this accident as well. We don't know for sure. And that is the good news in all of this, if there's good news in a tragedy like this, is it there's a high likelihood with the flight data recorder, hopefully it has enough parameters that would capture anything like that. And certainly in the cockpit voice recorder might be able to give us some indication. So, you know, one way or another, I think we'll we'll probably get some answers on this one. Don't you think, gentlemen? Yes, I do. I agree. Maybe not all the answers, but I think we'll get enough to to have some good takeaways. Yeah. And speaking of taking it away, it's all yours, John. Yep, here we go again. All right, pre-flight, pre-planning. Damn it, before you go flying, do your homework. Do a basic one before you leave your hotel room or your house. When you get to the airport, do it again based upon what you're seeing. In this case, it's coming out of maintenance. That should have changed a lot of things on your pre-planning. When you get out to your airplane, a good pre-flight. And on big airplanes, it's not so easy to do. But on little airplanes, touch your airplane. Wiggle your flight controls. You know, one of the things that I also do in my speeches, 
the the uh, there was an event that required an AD note against a Pico uh, wing attach point. And that was found because the pilot doing his walk around always wiggled the wig tip of his airplane. And on one occasion, he started wiggling and would hear a banging noise back towards the center of the airplane. And inspection revealed that there was corrosion and, and, uh, and it was deteriorating. It was loose. So, I mean, really pay attention to your airplane. Pay attention. And then after you get in the air, put your head on a swivel because today we have a lot of new pilots out there and they're sometimes flying heads down. You won't want to be involved in an accident with somebody else, regardless of whose fault it is. So put your head on a swivel and pay attention to what's around you. And please, please fly safely. Thank you for checking out our show. We really value our listeners and subscribers. Our podcast gets ranked by you and how much you like it. So please give us five stars in your podcast platform. We want to keep in contact with you. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, YouTube. You can email the show at flightsafetydetectives at gmail.com. By the way, if you're on YouTube, we're really working on growing the channel, and it helps if you all send in comments. Please do that. And we read all the comments. And be sure to subscribe. Remember, if you're in the market for aviation insurance, you can save 5% with Avemco just by mentioning our show. Visit them at www.avemco.com. That's it for this episode of the Flight Safety Detective. Until the next episode, fly safe.